at the time of this recording, Wizards of the Coast is continuing their attempt to revoke the open game license 1.0a. It doesn't much matter at this point whether they succeed, they've made their intent clear. They've made it impossible to trust them as caretakers of the legacy of the world's first role-playing game. Worse still, by demonstrating what they want to do, they've demonstrated that there's no stability within their organization. Even once Wizards changes its policies, as they did after 4th edition, it takes as little as executive of reorganization to set things back again. With a new president comes new policies, and there's no protection against a policy that threatens the community. Of course, by now we know that solutions are being developed by Paizo in the form of the Open RPG Creative License, and Cobalt Press in the form of Project Black Flag, and many others. The question is, how did we get to this point again? And what can Wizards of the Coast do to regain the community's trust? Again, a brief history of fumbles. I have to admit, the monumental mistake that was 4th edition didn't really affect me. I knew little of licensing back then. I was familiar with the concept through open source software, so I knew enough to recognize that 4th edition's license was anti-consumer. I played the 4th edition board games and enjoyed them, and I still do, but for the role-playing game, I switched to Pathfinder, and it was easy. Like many D&D players, I had spent the last several years reading Paizo's excellent content in Dungeon, Dragon, and Polyhedron magazines. Honestly, I'm not even sure I fully realized that Pathfinder existed because of 4th edition. Pathfinder just was sort of Paizo's setting for d and I mean, I knew 4th edition existed, I knew Pathfinder was a, a fork of it, but it never felt like I was abandoning d and I was just sort of changing venues. I guess I had a notion at that time, even then, that there was a, a D and D, a proper D ampersand D, and then just sort of D and D. In fact, I kind of like that the internet has prompted people, instead of writing D ampersand D, to just shorten that with D in D. It's the same thing without being the trademarked thing. When 5th edition came out, I was genuinely excited because it had returned to an open license. As with many players, I felt like I'd followed the careers of Mike Merles and Chris Perkins and James Wyatt and a lot of the other content creators for years, both in Paizo magazines and in books by other publishers like AEG. I was glad to have a reason to delve back into their content. The playtests and newfound transparency of D&D Next, or 5th edition as it became known, was refreshing, and I truly thought that Wizards had learnt its lesson. I played, as I do today, many different game systems, and so I added official D&D back into the mix. A lot of publishers built up their business on 5th edition, because there was a lot of business to be made. A lot of players came to the hobby because of 5th edition. During that time, Wizards of the Coast produced, mostly, quality products. But what was Wizards doing to protect itself and its growing community from itself? Wizards of the Coast, having recovered from a disastrous lapse in community engagement during 4th edition, had ample op opportunity during the 5th edition golden years to put up protections for its community first and foremost, as well as itself, and the D&D game itself, into place. It might seem strange to think that a company should consider protecting its customers from the company, but that's what a community-focused organization does, unquestionably. Important resources are put into foundations and trusts for for exactly that reason. That's what foundations are, that's why they exist. It's done with art, important historical, artifacts, software, and more. It needed to happen for D&D during the height of 5th edition's popularity, and Wizards of the Coast failed. It's obvious that what happened during 4th edition was entirely possible again. Everyone knew it, inside and outside of Wizards. Every time a 6th edition was mentioned during the height of 5e's popularity, the follow-up question was always whether it would continue to use the open game license. Fans had learned from 4th edition and were keenly aware that Wizards could migrate away from the license again. And then they did. And Paizo knew it too. 
Pathfinder 2 wasn't a new edition of D&D 3.5. I avoided it for about a year for that very reason. It wasn't close enough to 3.5 for me. To be clear, I've, I've come around by now. I've been playing Starfinder and Pathfinder 2 for years. But there's no direct connection to the D20 system of old. They didn't need the Open Gaming License 1.0a to release their game, and they only used it as a way to enable publishers to develop Pathfinder 2 content. We are the owners of our culture. Nobody expected the drastic swindle Wizards of the Coast ultimately attempted. The community is being asked to pay the price for Wizards' inability to foster, cultivate, and protect D&D culture. Luckily, much of the community has banded together to offload that price back onto Wizards of the Coast itself. Culture is an organic thing that happens when people share experiences. It's the way a society develops. Culture is the interactions and the ideas that people share. It's always been that way, and for most of human history, there was no concept of owning a culture to the extent of taking legal action against one another. It's a unique and sad modern development that culture is not free for everyone to share because, after all, we're all responsible for generating it. Culture is what we live together. With Paizo's announcement of an irrevocable open license committed to a community trust, the gaming community will have a license custom made for the relationship between a game system and third-party content. In addition to other open licenses like Creative Commons and GNU free documentation, the spirit and culture, if not the brand, of D&D is being preserved. Of course, D&D doesn't really need corporate sponsorship to be preserved, but sadly in the society we've built, it does need protection. There's nothing built into our society to prevent a corporation from claiming ownership of culture, and then, with the full support of the legal system, to prevent people from contributing to it. That's the state of culture, and it was very nearly the state of D&D, and still could be. It needs protection to remain free, and when I say it, I don't mean D&D. &D. I mean tabletop role-playing games, and D&D, &D, colloquially, meaning that game you play with your friends with the little miniatures on the table. Future Sight. Especially because the new C-Suite of Wizards of the Coast. I think they expect the controversy over their monopolization of D&D culture to fade away. They think the community will get over it and forget dutifully signing up to pay to play one D&D. The scary thing is that they still could be right. Think of all the uproar over the release of Windows 8 or Windows 11 or Office 365 or the outrage that Adobe's customers expressed when all of its software like Photoshop became subscription only or the industry shaking effect that Final Cut Pro X had on independent filmmakers and small studios. That's my industry, broadly speaking. I, I was there. People online swore blood oaths that they would forsake Microsoft, abandon Adobe, bury Apple. They were all walking away and voting with their wallet. Well, today Microsoft is as powerful a force as ever. I mean, heck, it just took over Wizards of the Coast. Adobe is still seen as an essential component to any design firm, and Apple is still the default platform for many independent filmmakers and studios. People's outrage often only lasts until they're mildly inconvenienced. Wizards of the Coast expects this to go the same way. People complain, vow to boy Boycott, and then they log in and pay for one D&D &D anyway. It's up to us, the D&D &D community, to ensure that this does not happen. Cancel your D&D Beyond.com account if you haven't already, and leave Wizard of the Coast's version of your favorite role-playing game for something truly open. That could be Pathfinder 2, it could be Cobalt Press's Project Black Flag, it could be 13th Age, it could be some other system that you fall in love with. But in a month, or two years, or five, or ten, or even twenty years in the future, when a new reformed Wizards of the Coast, or any company, swears they've learned their lesson without surrendering ownership of their rules system, their trademarks, and even their lore to the community that has made it successful, do not believe them.